So I will start this uh, last session of today with the topic on sediment and water compartments. There are in fact uh, this is covering three topics. The first two are relatively small topics. It's about uh, calculation of uh, marine versus freshwater sediment. Uh, topic 15 is dealing with the uh, use of the regional pack uh, for sediment in local pack calculation. And then the last topic is uh, dealing with nested local scale multimedia model. In fact, th this is a topic that perhaps it goes beyond the sediment and the water uh, compartments, but uh, it kind of, uh, yeah, we, we fit in this topic uh, here. So first, uh, what is the current situation? Uh, and sediment pack calculations in EUSES. Well, on the regional assessment, uh, we observed that the uh, KP, which is the solid water partition coefficient, uh, the same value is used for the fresh water and the marine uh, sediment uh, pack calculation. Uh, another observation that perhaps worthwhile to, to mention is the, the regional model in EUSES. Uh, it's a, a really a, a multimedia model. Eh? It means that all the compartments are fully uh, interlinked. Uh, at the local scale, again, the solid water partition coefficient is used both, the same value is used both for freshwater and marine sediment uh, pack calculation. Uh, another observation is that when the uh, local uh, pack sediment is calculated, uh, uh, this is not based on the regional pack sediment, uh, because uh, it's, so here's the equation for the uh, local uh, sediment pack, it's based on equilibrium uh, partitioning, uh, and it's in fact the regional pack uh, for the water compartment that is somehow translated into uh, sediment, uh, regional sediment contribution in the, the local uh, pack sediment. So in cases where, you, where there is more information, for example, measured data on the regional pack sediment, there's somehow an, an issue here that this information cannot be included or taken into account in the local uh, pack sediment uh, calculation. And then a third uh, observation is that the whole model concept of the local scale is, in fact, it's not really a multimedia model in the sense that uh, all the compartments are linked to each other. So it's more a kind of separate series of one compartment models, and obviously there are some links, uh, diffusion or advection processes going from one to another compartment, but they are not fully integrated. So let, let me uh, further elaborate on the, the changes proposed in the, the three different topics. Uh, so in the first topic, uh, the proposal is to allow to use for a different uh, solid water partition coefficient for the marine and the fresh water uh, environment. For some substances, it, it could be relevant to, to do a separate calculation because the partitioning behavior is also different in marine versus fresh water environment. We are, we've identified two options. One option is a relatively simple one. It's just to allow the user to input a separate uh, solid water partition coefficient for the marine environment. So it means in a default scenario, the, the two uh, KP values would be the same. But if you have the information on marine, you could enter that uh, information. And a second option goes a little bit more elaborate. It's really to try to re-evaluate the environmental characteristics of the marine um, water and sediment compartments in terms of, uh, uh, yeah, I think, organic uh, content or, or pH or other parameters that potentially could be used to improve a kind of default calculation. Perhaps we could, I'm not sure if we need to call it a QSAR, but at least uh, to allow to calculate a, a default 
solid water partition coefficient for the marine environment. This, ob this option obviously entails more discussion about how will we um, define that marine compartment. So if you want to see it more visually, uh, it would mean that for those that recognize the partition coefficient uh, win, uh, user window in uh, users, we would basically in option one have some additional fields for the marine uh, environment and then in the option two we would actually have some kind of uh, QSAR or, or default calculation uh, for that purpose. Um, I think on the second uh, topic, uh, I've not produced a separate slide. I think the proposal here is just that uh, um, the, the user is allowed to, to input or, or to, to use the regional PEC sediment in the local uh, PEC sediment calculation. And then uh, with respect to the third uh, topic, which is the nested local scale multimedia model, we've also developed uh, two options here, and I will start with the second option. Eh? The second option being uh, to try to revisit the, the thinking and the, the concept of local exposure assessment. And instead of using the current series of one compartment models, try to build a, a multimedia model with exchanges between the compartments, mm -hmm. but then also, and this is the, the word nested, eh, where there is also links and exchange of, of mass with, uh, with a regional scale. Now, given that this option is conceptually um, yeah, somehow different than the current local exposure model, it may be a bit too optimistic to to introduce uh, a, a change in, in this respect. And for that, uh, we, we propose as, as a first option uh, that somehow we do try to improve the current local scale model by taking some of the, you know, the low hanging fruit of the, or the relevant learning lessons or benefits of, uh, of a completed nested local scale multimedia model. So this could, for example, mean that we do not immediately consider a complete local multimedia model, but we do at least consider water and sediment as a two-compartment model, rather than now currently as two separate uh, models, and we'll kind of build mass balance from, from these two compartments already. Or another topic could be that we, we consider additional uh, fate processes at the local scale. I will give an example on that uh, later on. Eh? There could be improved uh, air deposition, that's a topic that uh, Joost already presented, or we just somehow already consider some of the nesting, of the improve the nesting of the local model uh, into, the, into the regional ones. With respect to the consideration of additional fate uh, processes, here we, we can see a table um, for a flowing water body and a static water body, and what well, we basically compare here the local scale uses, it's the STP local scale model, and then in the uh, product type 8, which is on the wood preservatives emission scenario document, there is also a specific model with even two tiers dealing with uh, emissions to local scale uh, flowing water body. And then you, you have a bunch of phase processes here, eh? and then uh, well, what can immediately observe that some phase processes are considered in, in one, whereas not in the other. Eh? Um, for example, um, a, one that, that struck me was that degradation in water, for example, is considered in the PT8 uh, ESD, and then, of course, it can also be questioned, is it relevant uh, to consider that also at the local scale uh, for the this, I mean, emission of the industrial or urban sewage treatment plants? And there are various other state processes that perhaps uh, can be considered uh, to be included as either as, as the default model or as higher tier models, as, uh, for example, it is presented in the, the PT8. So why are we proposing those uh, changes? Uh, um, well, the, the freshwater marine uh, KP value, it, it's, the benefit would, allow, would 
is that it would allow to differentiate between seawater and freshwater for those chemicals or do those cases where the partitioning behavior is different. Um, yeah, ob obviously also the, the, uh, the two other topics are to improve the local PEC sediment or in general just local PEC uh, calculation. With respect to the, the nested uh, local scale multimedia model, there are already various existing tools that can be considered and actually I could add another bullet point uh, that they presented this morning is the UBA simple two box three, if I uh, recall correctly. Yeah. And so in fact, those this this is already a local a multimedia model. Eh? But also in the simple box uh, version 3.2, maybe you're not aware of that, but there is already a local multimedia model inside the Excel calculation. But Obviously, it's not used in the e uses tool, but the model is already available uh, there. And then I think I've just highlighted here one, uh, the Merlin Export tool. I think there are other tools available that are addressing multimedia modeling uh, at the local scale, and that I think at least deserve uh, the consideration if there are any valuable learning lessons to, to take those uh, into account. Now, with respect to the proposed priorities um, on the um, solid water partitioning between freshwater and marine, I think the first option was something very simple, right? just an additional field, and then the default is freshwater and marine is the same. So we consider that to be ready. It, it seems relatively uh, uh, easy to do um, and, and important, but I think the, the simplicity of the, the topic is the main driver here to say that it can be implemented. The second one, uh, revisiting the marine compartments, uh, is something that's perhaps less ready because this would involve some, some further discussion on how to, uh, uh, how to define or, or, or improve the definition of those marine compartments. And then it could also be questioned how important is that. And for now, we've, we've uh, set that as a, as a low importance. Um, the other one is the use of the regional uh, PEC sediment in the PEC local calculation. So I think this would, the main benefit is if you have measured data on the regional PEC sediment. And I think this was also one of the ECTOC uh, recommendations that, of course, more and more monitoring data become available in our data a society uh, today, so it, it yeah it would make sense or, or helpful that we also try to to bring in uh, those data when they are available, and that's why it was also ranked as ready and important. With respect to the nested local scale model, um, yeah, currently we said that it's not ready. It's not it, it is ready from I think scientific point of view uh, in the sense that there are already existing tools and, and there is already experience, but maybe it's not ready because it, it, it does require a little paradigm shift in the mindset of uh, the local exposure modeling and yeah, I, there will be a whole bunch of questions, what will be the implications, what are the changes and uh, I think in that respect and the more awareness or, or seeing the benefits of that is, is something that's uh, not not ready. Um, some of the the yeah, what would I call here the light? Uh, the first option where we take some elements could be important at least to consider. It's not ready, but important to consider for further uh, discussion. Okay, the next set of uh, topics will be on uh, man via the environment. Uh, so. Maybe this scenario is something that, that you use less, than, uh, it, so it, it looks uh, like this. It starts from uh, environmental predictions in uh, air, soil, groundwater, and surface water, and then through various exposure pathways, um, it uses calculates potential, uh, let's say, accumulation, uh, and uh, assesses the human intake of uh, chemicals indirectly via the environment. And this assessment uh, can be done at the local scale and at the regional scale. And 
yeah, so in users have simplified the human diet into uh, inhalation of air, uh, consumption of root crops and leafy crops, uh, consumption of dairy products, meat, drinking water, and, uh, and fish. So this scenario, it's a standard default scenario, both under REACH and uh, BPR, but it's a scenario that is perhaps not often conducted because it's either not relevant or it's usually the, environment, uh, the environmental protection goals that are driving the risk assessment. Uh, and if the environment is protected, then in many cases also the humans indirectly exposed via the environment are, uh, are protected. However, the um, Men by the environment scenario becomes more important under REACH uh, authorization process. Uh, and the REACH authorization process, the objective is to, well, I think we, uh, you also start from release, exposure, you calculate some excess risk, but then in a socio-economic analysis, you go beyond the risk estimates by also trying to uh, estimate the population impact. Uh, so then you're translating an excess risk with the size of exposed uh, population into what is called here statistical impact, but I prefer the word population impact. And uh, this population impact is then further monetized because it's part of the socioeconomic assessment outweighing the socioeconomic benefits against the, the, the costs due to the risks. Uh, now, if you, if there's a, a little example here on top, if you look at the workers, we, we, we know, and in generally speaking, I, I have to say, uh, the, the risk for the workers is usually larger than the risk for a, a man via the environment. Uh, so a, a, a person living nearby an industrial facility, for example, and then breathing air and consuming locally grown uh, vegetables uh, and so on. But in these type of assessments, if you multiply this uh, risk or excess risk uh, with the size of the impacted population, uh, the story becomes completely different. Eh? Because, uh, well, of course, not in all cases, but there can be cases where the poor population is significantly smaller than the population living uh, around these uh, industrial facilities. Eh? And then all of a sudden, the man via the environment scenario can become the driver of the, the entire risk assessment. So this is just to illustrate that this scenario becomes more important or will also become more important uh, in, the, in the future. So what's the current situation in the EU uh, This Again, I'm showing uh, one of the user inputs. Uh, screens uh, where there's a specific section here on human exposure. Uh, normally, many of these parameters are calculated by default. Uh, so it's the partition coefficient between leaves and air, between, between plant tissue and water, stream transpiration, bioaccumulation, meat, milk, and, and so on. So why do we need an update? Well, again, we'll, we have to make a distinction between two groups of chemicals. Uh, first, the organic ones, uh, the non-ionized, non-dissociating chemicals, let's say those chemicals for which their environmental fate, also the um, fate in, in indirect exposure via the environment, is driven by the octanal water partition coefficient, or at least it can be reasonably assumed that octanal water partition coefficient is a surrogate for its uh, fate in, in that uh, food chain. And then secondly, it's the ionized chemicals, dissociating uh, chemicals or metals for which, for which we simply cannot assume that the octanal water partition coefficient is driving the, the environmental fate. Yeah. For, for this group of chemicals uh, currently, the calculations for plants and roots are simply out of the applicability domain of the uses and it's currently a gap in uh, e-uses. For the organic ones, also in recent literature, it's been observed that the plant leaves underestimate, are underestimated uh, for the hydrophilic compounds, <coughs> root crops are overestimated, and there are already improved uh, estimation modules for meat and uh, milk. 
So the change proposed is somehow that the uh, users, I'm simplifying this a little bit, but at least that the user can uh, can or select or is automatically selected whether the demand via the environment assessment needs to be driven by the octanal water partition coefficient or whether a kind of alternative uh, assessment needs to be done. And of course, we need to think about the naming and so on. Uh, that's to be further considered. So let's first focus on the a group of uh, substances that are driven by the octanal water partition coefficient. For the plant lease, for example, uh, there is a more recent model available uh, to estimate the transpiration stream concentration uh, factor. Also for the root crops, uh, there is a more recent model uh, that is uh, yeah, be more uh, accurate or more realistic. Uh, to the, the problem at stake. Uh, and also for the meat and milk calculations of uh, the bioaccumulation factors, as in the European project OSIRIS, a, mo a model developed that, uh, that has improved uh, this, uh, these particular processes. Now, with respect to the substances that are not driven by the LOKOW, um, there's a proposal to allow the user to input some kind of alternative and in fact they are even more simplified um, transfer factors for the fate. So I have to say that this is a bit driven by, by research on the, on the metals. Yeah? So it's also still to be seen, I think, uh, to which extent this would be a, a good approach for dissociating or ionizable uh, chemicals. But the, the proposal is to introduce new parameters, which would be a transfer factor uh, from uh, soil to roots, eh? uh, which is, again, a kind of equilibrium par partition coefficient almost uh, between the plant on one hand and the soil on the other hand. So, and then similarly for the leaves and the grass, one would be, would be able to input such a value. Uh, this information could be collected from the literature. Eh? There's also, especially also in agricultural area, vast majority of literature where, at least for the metals, uh, I have to speak now, where there is information on, on measured concentrations in the plants and the soil. And the model equations would even be simpler because it's just multiplying the, the transfer factors with the soil concentration to calculate roots, leaves, and uh, grass uh, concentrations. So to conclude on, on this one, um, I, for both topics, eh, uh, so the organic ones and the, the uh, ionized ones, we, we felt this, uh, is, uh, these topics are important for the reason of authorization I gave earlier in the presentation. And also I feel they are ready because it's already published in, uh, in the scientific literature. And yeah. And, not aware of, of many uh, yeah, difficult um, questions about this. Yes, uh, this issue is about secondary poisoning. Um, also relates to uh, man environment. Um environments. Um, Yes, uh, there are currently three uh, food chains incorporated in the users, two for the aquatic environment um, and one for the uh, terrestrial environment. Um, uh, the, for the uh, aquatic environment, um, the food chain goes from water to fish and fish eating predators and additional one including top predators as well. Um, So for the freshwater and envi marine environment, uh, besides BCFs, also biomagnification factors must be applied. Uh, and these BMFs can be derived from either the LOC AOW or the BCF for fish. Um, so going all the way up from water concentrations to top predators, you need two BMF values. Um, so, um, in the OSIRIS project, 
a proposal has been made to uh, uh, to more details uh, or more levels to include additional levels in the, in the aquatic food chain, uh, including plankton uh, and uh, piscivorous uh, fish, um, because uh, feeding fish feeding on plankton will also uh, contribute to bioaccumulation, um, as well as uh, the addition, additional tropic level of piscivorous fish, uh, which is currently ignored in users. Um, uh, another proposal has been made to add or extend the terrestrial food chain, uh, going from soil and earthworms to worm-eating predators and adding the sub-predators. This is merely proposed to uh, pr promote the consistency uh, in the risk assessment. Uh, so having the same number of tropic levels in the aquatic food chain uh, and, and the terrestrial food chain. Uh, the issue here is that in that specific case, you need BMFs for top predators. Uh, and the question actually is, do we have this kind of data available for the terrestrial food chain? Um, uh, so we could, yeah, are there any QSARs to derive uh, K, uh, BMF values from from the KLW, um, so that's that's the main issue, I guess. Um, and the other issue, of course, is what other question is what's the added value of adding a or extending the terrestrial food chain? Um, so will this provide any new insights um, uh, about uh, well the priority level? Uh, uh, we thought this is of medium importance. Um, so secondary poisoning is particularly uh, relevant for chemicals with uh, LACOW uh, above five. Um, it's not completely ready because we have to think about either we're going to replace this uh, new food chain as proposed in the uh, Osiris project or do we want to somehow fit it in in the, the current uh, uses food chain? Um, and as I said before, uh, for the terrestrial food chain, uh, default values for the BMS have to be provided. Uh, and I think there's some additional, so further research needed, whether these are available or maybe we can rely on the BMS that uh, are currently used for the aquatic food chain. This, we're talking about nanomaterials. Everybody familiar? It's supposed to be between one and 100 nanometers. So it's kind of a different form of maybe existing chemicals and more. Um, so currently, and in that way, it's, uh, yeah, the idea is it would be quite a yeah, change in the way the users would uh, with models, this type of chemicals, particulates. Because how it's done now is you, you have these partition and coefficients and uh, you assume a term, thermodynamic equilibrium. And uh, as actually a colleague of mine, yours, Maesters, showed in a paper, uh, it's not the case for, for particulates or nanomaterials, which are actually thermodynamically unstable because of the, they are much bigger. And uh, they actually dissolve uh, or could dissolve which means the, the solution, or they are not in a dissolved state themselves. They, uh, the solution kind of removes or, or degradation process maybe even. And in a, in a sense, because a, a nanomaterial is a particulate, they also have different shapes and different forms. And you can then, the aggregates, uh, they can also uh, transform into, in this case, uh, either homo aggregates or heterogeneous aggregates with other particles. So that was the reason that uh, there was an update needed and the simple box was updated by Joris Meisters. And to do that, he uh, said we needed to change the deposition, uh, we needed to add the solution, and also add the attachment process to other natural particles that are present in the environment. So, the way this is done is, is by use of process rate constants and not anymore about by partitioning coefficients. 
So uh, what this looks like in the whole, uh, some of the transport processes are changed, uh, mainly through the deposition from air to soil and in the water from water to sediment. And these were updated based on uh, colloidal and uh, theory and particle physics. In, in theory, the advection processes are, are similar. So then also transformation was included where you have uh, you start, let's say, with your nanomaterial, your nanoparticle, and it would uh, heat agglomerate with natural particles to form, in this case, we hypothesize two different sizes of natural particles, smaller ones, colloidal kind of particles, below form 50 nanometers and larger than form 50 nanometers, coarse particle, which would result in these two fractions of heat agglomerates being formed. The other process is dissolution, so all these three particles potentially can dissolve uh, in time. And then you also have, of course, the dissolved analog of your nanomaterial. And then in the end, uh, it's potential that these particles themselves degrade by other kind of processes. So the output of the model, I have not really talked about the input parameters, but you could ask me maybe later if you want to know. Uh, but the output is either you got a concentration of your free nanomaterial, you got a concentration of the what we say the bioavailable concentration, which is according to the definition what I think is smaller than 50 nanometer in theory what passes through a filter of 0.45 microns. And you could use the the output of the total particle concentration, which also includes this coarse uh, particle form. And then you have a concentration of the dissolved resulting uh, Compound. And this could be used. And, uh, so, in the overall assessment, uh, which, which was done, it was deemed of high importance. It's technically ready. The simple box for nano model is ready. So, the phase part uh, as a, it's, it's available for download as an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, this modeling approach includes now, as I told you, different species. You have three particulate species and actually also still the dissolved species. So that could also help, uh, yeah, uh, modeling the sim in a similar way other chemicals or, or such as especially metal species or, or even microplastics, much bigger particles in that sense than nanomaterials. Uh, it's relevant uh, because the reach annexes are adapted now or for nanomaterials, or at least we are in this process. And uh, some specific nanomaterial information requirements would come into effect in 2020, uh, if that's all good. Well, I guess. Uh, it was deemed not ready for implementation because this is only the page part, and you have other modules of, of the uses which are, are not adapted for nanomaterials, which would need to be probably uh, uh, yeah, made fit for nano as well, such as the, the emission release uh, model and the, probably also the local scale model. And also the probably Zeus, let's uh, say simple treat is not yet simple treat for nano. So yeah, that was the second topic I'll be talking about is uh, release and fate of sparingly soluble chemicals. And it's related to the previous in the sense that, uh, that well, the idea is that uh, users should, should be able to consider these, these types of uh, substances, solid substances. And uh, uh, in this sense, it's related to you would have an emission of a solid substance and the solution would play a role and it's it's not enough to know the, the, the solubility, but you would need to know a time-dependent kinetic parameter of how fast is this dissolved uh, in time, because that's usually what, why it's a solid in the first place, because it's not instant. So the priority was uh, suggested that it's not ready, of low importance. Uh, it affects all sparingly soluble chemicals, and uh, the implementation could be related to the to the implementation for nanomaterials. Uh, the impact on exposure was expected to be large, and 
but there would also be new data requirements. And there's actually also a case, the case for, for nanomaterials, there would be requirements for new input parameters. And in this case, uh, for example, the solution rate in addition to the solubility. So Good afternoon again. Uh, this time I would like to present uh, shortly our proposal for metal. This presentation was uh, made by me and the treasury. And as obviously it is commonly known, the, the yeast has been primarily developed for the neutral organic compounds. That's why some assumptions already provided there are not correct for the metal compounds. And we have identified several gaps for metals in the current yeast. One of them is that in the current version, only the total dissolved and particulate fractions can be can be distinguished. That's why uh, any any estimation would pose overestimation of the metals by availability. The next thing is that uh, in the absence of the measure data, in case of neutral organic compounds, it is possible to calculate partition coefficients, but only on the octanal water partition coefficient, what obviously is not correct for, for the metals, and that's why it is must be supported by the measure data for metals. What is also important, any kind of equations already given in the uses, uh, which allows to, to derive, to calculate partition coefficients, are independent of the environmental chemistry chemistry of, of environmental compartments, as it is well known from the science-specific point of view that, uh, for example, pH or BSC content in fresh water or any other kind of chemistry of any other uh, compartment affects uh, m uh, much the dissociation of the metals and how uh, it's bioavailable. The next thing we have identified as the cap in the current uses is that, as you all know for sure, one of the most important trade process is biodegradation, which of course is not applicable for metals. On the other hand, the current uses does not allow to, to, uh, in, to implement, to, to specify any kind of specific metal trade processes, which would refer also to the longer term period. The last gap is it's probably quite simple, but we thought it's maybe it's worth to mention uh, it right now and to make the users more and more use friendly, is that for some of metals and also the other inorganic compounds, sometimes it is agreed to use the other disk approach. Currently it is not possible in users, that's why we have to do some simple but external calculation outside users. So maybe it would be good to implement it in possibility in the new future. Uh, the, this presentation will be followed in that way that I will present quite shortly our proposals on the metals bioavailability, tax refinement in the regional scale, some addition, uh, addition of the metal specific phase processes into users, and how natural background concentration could be taken into account within this model. From many scientific studies and data, uh, it's known that it is better to, in case of metals to rely on the truly dissolved form. It means that instead of uh, the approach taken for organic compounds where we have total dissolved fractions, in case of metals we should take into account truly dissolved, it means the free ion species and those in inorganic complexes. And while the uh, colloidal forms of form, most DLC bonds should be excluded from the further assessment. Uh, such approach has been already implemented in the one of the at least one environmental model, such as Yisa. So we think uh, it is good for to start to, to think how it could be also implemented in users to which extent and how. Uh, from this uh, from this literature data, we knew that. To do this so correctly, some geochemical speciation model, for example, one could be used. 
and what is really important in that case is that thanks to that we could derive more adequate key values for the metals is dependent on the type specific chemical conditions of environmental of compartment of the concern. On this slide, you can easily see we have here the, uh, the example of the copper speciation in the surface water. And as you can see, depending on the ecoregion, uh, ecoregion uh, within the Europe, and of course, the chemistry of the freshwater compartment, the speciation of copper uh, may differ even largely. Why that KT? The rotation is so important for metal here. On this slide, we can see that this, uh, the value which we choose at last for the metal, which uh, will have huge impact on the on the pack in fresh water and the sediment in this case. Depending on the chosen value, we can see uh, it's again the, the case for copper uh, that different impacts in freshwater may differ even 10 times. The same occurs for the sediment. Of course, uh, the relation is opposite, but the difference might be even three times. As already indicated in the previous presentation, uh, you know already that we would rather not like to touch anything on the scenic side in two years. This slide is just to pay attention that whatever bioavailability correction is performed on the peak side, the same should be done on the phoenix side as well, uh, independent of whether it will be done inside or outside uses. As I have mentioned earlier, the other uh, important topic which relates to the adequate uh, assessment for metal is that, that the current assessment practice does not reflect its, re its uh, real phase. Uh, on this graph, uh, here we have present on copper, and as can be seen, the steady state is reached after thousands of, of years. For the, in case of the other matter, uh, metals, it can be reached also after hundreds of, uh, or thousands of years. Uh, such taking into account this, uh, this approach at the current stage is in users is not possible. That's why it, uh, we propose, actually, Freddy proposed to, to rely on the existing tool, a uh, simple box spreadsheet, which allow the user to, to calculate that in regional say, after the defined time period, relevant for each kind of metal, because it, can, uh, it, it depends uh, which uh, metal we assess exactly. Uh, and thanks to that, better reflect the phase and the, the correct phase for metals. Something comparable is already done for the local phase, so we think that something more or less that the same template could be, could be done on the regional scale. This proposal is ready to be used, in our opinion, and could be implemented pretty in a near future. The other proposal, how to improve uh, the, the approach on the fake processes relevant for the metals, but uh, which will need much more discussion, it's not ready to be, to be used and implemented in users, is to add into our model, in users, the specific metal processes, which are not taken into account right now at all. Uh, in that case, we could rely on the existing models, such as ticket UWM in case of freshwater compartment and sediment, or the IDMM model in case of the soil compartment. As can be seen on the screen, I, I hope it, it really can be still, uh, seen easily that in compared to the ticket UWM model, users have much, much less relevant processes included already. In this template. Here we have the graphical presentation of the ticket museum and the processes in water and sediment compartment, uh, where the relevant metal site processes are, are considered. And as proposed uh, in the background document prepared by Frederick, we think that there should be uh, initiated some discussion on the uh, 
metal specific phase processes such as metal bending, precipitation, some dilution kinetics, uh, cycling of organic metal, and sulfur production. In case of the soil compartment, we could uh, rely to at least some extent on the ID and M model. And what we think is the most important in, in, in this model is that uh, it allows to, to differentiate different uh, form of metals. I uh, meaning the labial form, the age, and the mineral. Uh, it will be, could be still beneficial for users because the current practice that is done right now that we calculate some facts for the metal, and then outside users, we, that we do some posterior read correction, of course, on the basis of some studies, but we are not fully really sure whether it's an adequate way how to reflect the phase processes of the metal in the circumstances, for example. We think that implementation of such modeling would uh, allow us to, or, uh, to take into account this form of methods in the, in the intermediate results, and then the, the final fact, fact value would already have been taken into account. As already I, I have said, for at least some of the metals and also some inorganic compounds, there is an uh, agreement that the total risk approach should be taken into account. This proposal from our side is to just simply add some cells uh, below that uh, calculated uh, fat concentration in each rebel compartment and, ju and just to add the background concentration regional and or uh, natural pristine. Uh, it's already a great approach for at least some of the metasolin organic compounds and it was just uh, make the current users uh, more use friendly. It, as I said at the beginning, we just wouldn't have to perform any any calculation of the outside users in that purpose, and we could just readily uh, compare the total pack with the appropriate derived schema. So, concluding all what has been said, we have tried, we have proposed uh, four topics uh, in relation to the metal improvements in the user's models. Two of them, uh, I mean the facts of in the regional scale and uh, taking natural background concentration into account. We think that these topics are ready to use and high important. High important because uh, volume of metals and the rich especially is quite high. And in case of biotida projects, uh, of course, there are not so many active substances which are metals, but the products containing them, uh, the number of such products might be quite huge. Uh, in the context of the other proposed topics, um, meaning bioavailability concepts and addition of specific metal site processes into users, we realize that this, so, uh, these issues are for sure not ready for, the, for implementation. There is much more discussion needed, not only on the regulatory side, but firstly on some technical side. Nevertheless, again, uh, we think that these topics are really important to greater reflect the assessment for metal. In case of this long-term project, long-term project the uh, topic, we think that uh, at least the choice of the biochemical regions for each kind of metal should be discussed firstly. Uh, then uh, if we decide uh, which, what, what the number of the regions should be taken as sound, uh, we think that also there should be some agreement whether we should use some worst case on the pH, DLC, and the other uh, chemistry parameters of environmental compartment, or whether it should be some worst case. Uh, as I said, there is um, many study data or even some environmental models started to, to, to refer to the chemical cessation models. And we think, we, we propose here only as an example the one model, but there are also the others. So we think that should be also some agreement what, which model would be the best. 
and whether is it possible at all to implement it in free uses, or whether it is possible only to some extent, and the other more complicated, uh, let's say, calculations would be derived out, outside our model. In the context of the additional addition of the long-term method of processes, like mineralization and fluidization, for sure we should also discuss how to take them into account in the current users, which of them we think that are relevant, and probably we would achieve much more other questions which would have, have some solutions. And so the next topic is on parallel assessment uh, for multi-constituent substances and for substances transforming on use um, in the STP. Um, what, what we currently have in AUSES is the so-called hydrocarbon uh, block method. Um, it enables parallel, uh, parallel exposure and hazard assessment of defined blocks, but again, mainly for hydrocarbons. Um, it is locked for biocide assessment on local scale, so for the time being it can only be done if you do the standard assessment for, 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 for general chemicals. So what is proposed as a change? Um, the parallel assessment consent um, should be applicable also to other cases than hydrocarbons, uh, means assessment of multi-constituent uh, chemicals, uh, assessment of several substances as part of a mixture, and assessment of substances uh, and its transformation products. Um, it is similar to the risk assessment approach implemented in KESAR, the assessment entities that um, Helen already mentioned this morning uh, for multiple constituent uh, substances and transformation products. And the logic of these uh, entity assessment is in fact more or less uh, in line with the uh, hydrocarbon clock uh, module. Um, some words on the functioning of the assessment entities in KESAR. So, um, um, you introduce, in fact, a separate, a separate property data set, means you can include several substances um, in, in KESAR. And, um, yeah, the data sets um, can, in fact, vary, and you could reflect also in that way, um, you could include data sets from transformation products as well as parent substances. And so what you need to include um, is the proportion for each element um, that, that you would like to assess. And uh, yeah, what we would propose, in fact, is that the hydrocarbon plug, uh, block module in users uh, should be used in the same way. However, there are some limitation uh, on static, with regard to static parallel assessment, um, and it's only possible where no temporal variations uh, are taken into um, account. Proposed way forward, we yeah, accept and block the hydrocarbon plug uh, module for biocides and adapt it um, for biocide specific emission estimation. Um, and it should be then also renamed more gener uh, generically to reflect its usability for, for, for other substances. Priority, priority level, it has a high importance um, for, for given reasons. Possibility is needed uh, for parallel exposure assessment uh, not available for biocides so far, and also for the assessment of um, multi-constituent substance mixtures, transformation products, and so on. And it would be also ready for, for implementation. Um, should I go to the tree, because it's only three? Yeah, yeah. 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 Then we take the three topics in one go, and then take questions at the end. Uh, the next one, next one because there are to certain, uh, certain point a little bit related. The next one is the assessment of substance, uh, substances transforming in the environment. Uh, the current situation in uses is that there is no module available um, to uh, perform an exposure or risk assessment for transformation products, uh, taking into account degradation transformation processes. And what we mean with that, uh, when you look at the focus model, focus ground, ground water or surface water, you do a successive assessment. You include your data for the parent, you include your transformation uh, to the, uh, the measure transformation in, in tests to the, to, the, to the metabolite, and then the DT50 of the metabolite, and you can run, in fact, the model um, in, in, in one go. And something like that simply does not exist in e-users. So what we would need is to explore the need for refining the assessment method when substances are transformed in the environment. 
and there is already information available, so this multi-species mass balance modeling implemented by Van Zem, mm -hmm. as well as the OSIRIS project. Um, so far, we think it has a medium importance because uh, there is need for further validation of available principles and methodology of modeling. Also, the regulatory relevance and acceptance um, would need to be further assessed and the update would uh, affect a limited number of substances transforming in the environment into products uh, of concern. So it is, in fact, uh, not ready for implementation so far. And last but not least, we have the aggregated uh, local exposure assessment for biocides. Um, the current situation is, according to the biocidal products regulation, um, it, you would need to assess an aggregated exposure assessment um, it's part um, of the legal requirements, and um, it is, for example, accounted in Article 83 and Article 92C of the BPR. Um, specific guidance on aggreg aggregated exposure assessment for biocides is currently under preparation. Um, what we have so far and what we apply, uh, apply already so far is a decision tree, uh, which I'm showing later. Uh, however, in EU uses, the exposure assessment for biocides for single use um, is implemented. However, the aggregated exposure assessment we usually perform outside um, EU uses. So what do we propose? Implement in uses the possibility to assess several uses for the same active substance in one assessment, and that means within, within one product type and also between different product types. And uh, yeah, please note, KESAR already supports the local assessment of some of all widespread uses. In KESAR, it is already um, implemented, um, but simultaneous use at a given site um, is not yet supported in the current um, KESAR version. So priority level, uh, we think it is of high importance uh, for biocides specifically according to ECHA. There were some reservations noted by ECETOC and it's nearly ready for implementation.